could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire Yet you can't see the flames You see cascading Projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition But it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying The bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusions Okay, hi, I'm Bill Olson, and what you see behind me is what we're going to show next. If there's actually been news. I guess you don't see behind me. I was looking at the wrong screen. <laughs> what we're going to show next is the latest news on 9-11, and we had on Tuesday. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> on Tuesday, we had the uh, 10th anniversary of the completion of the Thomas uh, Keaton uh, <laughs> Lee Hamilton the 9-11 Commission Report. Okay, so it, it took him 10 years to come up with this latest thing. I, I, I had hopes, you know, it was advertised that they were going to put out their new recommendations based on the last 10 years, and all it was was a continued whitewash, but they gave lip service to transparency at least, but they didn't recommend... And they didn't continue talking about how they've been lied to and they didn't demand a new investigation or anything, but I think we'll go ahead and play this. This is only, it's less than five minutes. And uh, then we'll play something from David Ray Griffin. So, okay, I guess we'll go ahead and play this and enjoy. Well, we'd like to open up to some questions. Uh, we have... 
Mike Runners. I think we're going to start. Matt. Matt. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Matt. Matt Salito. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, my name is Matthew Salito. My son, Matthew C. Salito, was on the 105th floor in Tower 1 when it was hit, and we lost my son, Matthew, that day. I was asked by the commission uh, back in the beginning for my wife and I to be part of the uh, families that the commission could use to bounce off information before they went to the public. I remember back then that uh, there were 28 pages that were classified. The commission uh, did not want these uh, pages to be classified, but the executive branch of our government kept them classified. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, former Senator Bob Graham, Representative Lynch, and Representative Jones uh, tried to get them declassified, and they even brought H.R. 428 uh, and tried to get a ruling to get them declassified. Uh, till this day, they are still declassified. They're still classified, I'm sorry. They are still classified. I'd like to know from uh, the gentleman up on the dais, what are your feelings to this day, and do you still think they should be declassified? Well, I, uh, yes, they should be. I am embarrassed that they're not declassified. We emphasize throughout transparency. And when I, uh, I assumed incorrectly that our records would be public, all of them, everything. And then when I learned that a number of the documents were classified or even redacted, uh, I was surprised and disappointed. I want those documents declassified. I'm embarrassed to be associated with a work product that is secret. I just say very briefly, Matt, in, in, in this democracy, very little ought to be classified. Only the most seriously important national security issues, and there are very few of them. Uh, my experience, I was, from, I think almost every other commissioner had an access to to classified information before under a security clearance. I never had. I was the outsider, so I was very excited when I got my first shiny right to look at secrets. <laughs> and uh, I was amazed in reading the stuff that it was stuff I knew already. I remember the first time I read the whole report, my classification, I turned to the FBI guy who was watching me and said, uh, and said I knew all this already. And he said, yes, but you didn't know it was true. Uh, that, that is not a reason for classification. But I'd say, Lee, I don't know, if, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I'd say 60 to 70 percent anyway of the stuff we saw that was classified, in my opinion, should not have been and should have been available to the American people. This is an example of the kind of thing that should be, as I remember that particular section, it has been updated, because I think we did research on that particular episode in San Diego with Saudi Arabia, and I believe if you read the 9-11 report, you'll find anything you want to find about that particular section. But there's no reason to classify it anymore. Even if some of the facts are wrong, that can be pointed out. But I just don't believe in keeping things secret in the American. We're not strong a nation if we keep less secret from our people, I think. Okay, yeah, the 28 pages, oops, let's stop that. The 28 pages of uh, redacted material, it's, it's amazing. Well, we've got more stuff to, to show. I'm going to show a clip from a David Ray Griffin movie from actually 2011. But, uh, you know, it's things that we haven't said on this show for a while, and David Ray Griffin is 
the one who says it so well. We'll be coming back right after that, and I'll show you the Israelis who are rejoicing over all the mayhem happening, to, and also called for the complete annihilation of the Palestinians, and then kind of went, tee -hee, I'm kind of a fascist, I guess. So we have that video for you. And uh, I'm also going to get to the crisis on our borders in the southwest United States. So anyway, if you're ready to play that, go ahead and let it rip. This is David Ray Griffin. We'll be back in half an hour. Only as residue from nanothermite, which is classified as a high explosive. Thermite, ordinary thermite, is an incendiary. It causes fires. It's been around for over 100 years. But nanothermite was only created in the 1990s. And it is an incendiary, but also a high explosive, more powerful than most explosives, high explosives that you know about. The dust even includes active thermitic material discovered by physicist Stephen Jones, which appears to be unreacted nanothermite because when you put a flame to it, it explodes. So it's not paint. This is the conclusion of the new paper which I mentioned earlier, for which the first author is Copenhagen's Niels Herrett, who is an expert in nanochemistry. When NIST was asked whether it had checked the dust for evidence of thermite, it said no. When a reporter asked Michael Newman, a NIST spokesman, why not, he said, because there was no evidence of that. This circular answer led the reporter to ask, but how can you know there's no evidence if you don't look for it first? Newman replied, if you're looking for something that isn't there, you're wasting your time and the taxpayer's money. NIST also ignored and distorted testimonial evidence that explosions had gone off in Building 7. The most important such testimony was given by Barry Jennings of the New York City Housing Authority. As soon as the North Tower was struck that morning at 8.46 a.m., Jennings rushed, as he was supposed to, to the 23rd floor of Building 7, which housed Mayor Rudy Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management. But when he got there, along with Michael Hess, Giuliani's lead attorney for New York City, his corporation counsel, they found that everyone had left, and left suddenly. There were half-eaten sandwiches. There were steaming coffee cups. Calling to ask what they should do, Jennings was told, you should get out of the building and get out of there fast. They tried to go down the elevator. It would not work. So they started running down the stairs as fast as they could. Jennings, a big man, said he was taking one landing a landing at a time. Finding, uh, but when they got to the sixth floor, Jennings said the, the landing was blown out from under them by a giant explosion and they were only barely able to hold on to a pole, pull themselves up, go back up to the eighth floor where they broke a window and signaled for help. And Jennings said, I looked out the window this way and that way, and I saw both towers were still standing. They had been struck at that time, but they were still standing. Which makes sense, because this would have been about 9.15. However, when Giuliani wrote about the 9.11 experience of his friend Michael Hess, he claimed that this big event that they called an explosion was really just some effects from the debris from the collapse of Building uh, 1, the North Tower. Now, when did the North Tower come down? At 1028. So, at least about an hour and a quarter later, 
than the event they reported. Nevertheless, Giuliani's version became the official story. It was defended by NIST in its 2005 report on the Twin Towers, which also mentioned a little bit about Building 7. And then in 2008, by a BBC special on Building 7. And by the way, the BBC, which was at one time a great network, has now become one of the main defenders of the Bush-Cheney conspiracy theory about 9-11. Jennings had told his story in an interview for the producers of Loose Change Final Cut, for which I happen to be the script consultant, so I know something about what went on behind the scenes. Before the film was released, Jennings begged Dylan Avery the, 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 maker of, the main maker of the film, to delete his interview from the film for fear that he would lose his job. Avery agreed. But later, Jennings gave an interview for the BBC, told the same story, but the BBC put his story within the official timeline. And so they made it appear as if what Jennings called a big explosion was just, as the British narrator put it, just debris from a falling skyscraper. The BBC even made it seem as if Jennings was all by himself rather than accompanied by Hess, even though Jennings kept saying, we went down the stairs and then we climbed back up to the eighth floor. They made it seem as if Jennings was all by himself. This BBC program was aired in July of 2008. NIST, whose timeline the BBC had followed, released the first draft, this draft for public comment, on Building 7 the following month, August of 2008. Shortly before this release, evidently only two days before, Barry Jennings, who was 53 years old, appeared to have died mysteriously. Those who have tried to find out why he died couldn't get no answer, other than that he died in a hospital. Whatever the cause of his death, it was certainly convenient. He was not around to be interviewed again, perhaps by the Loose Change producers, after the NIST report appeared. And the BBC was able to put out a new version of its report on Building 7, this time including Michael Hess, who since 2002 had been the vice chairman of Rudy Giuliani's consulting business. Not surprisingly, Hess supported the official timeline. The BBC made much of this, saying, well, conspiracy theorists have said we distorted Jennings' timeline. But Michael Hess, who was there, confirms that we got the timeline right, that the so-called explosion was really just debris from the falling North Tower. <laughs> to see the falsity of that timeline, one only has to look at the interview of Jennings by the Loose Change producers, which you can now see on the internet. Look under Barry Jennings Uncut. The timely and mysterious death of Jennings, moreover, may well indicate just how threatening the truth about Building 7 is to the official conspiracy theory about 9-11. In any case, I will point out one more way in which Building 7 has proved to be the Achilles heel of the Bush-Cheney administration's conspiracy theory about 9-11. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Building 7 came down in virtual freefall. In the first draft of its report, which was issued in August of last year, 
NIST claimed that the collapse took far longer than would a freefall collapse. This was very important to NIST because the 9-11 truth movement had been saying all along, Building 7 came down in freefall or virtual freefall. And NIST said, oh, no, no, 40% slower than freefall, not, not really close. It also explained why NIST did. Given its theory, which is a theory of progressive collapse, absolute freefall would have been impossible. But David Chandler, a high school physics teacher in the United States, produced a video showing, showing that the building came down in absolute freefall for over two seconds. Now, absolute freefall means that if you had dropped a brick off the side of the building, at the same time the building started to collapse, the brick and the roof line would have descended at the same acceleration. They would have accelerated simultaneously. That would mean that there was absolutely nothing, no steel, no concrete, no nothing, stopping or delaying, slowing down the fall of the top part of the building. That means that all 82 steel columns had to disappear. They couldn't be giving any resistance whatsoever. Besides putting his video on the internet, Chandler confronted NIST with his evidence at a public meeting which was broadcast live. So there was no way that NIST could hide what he had revealed. In his final report, which came out in November, NIST rather amazingly admitted that Building 7 came down in absolute freefall for 2.25 seconds. But it had not changed its theory, which says that freefall is impossible. So you had an absolute contradiction in this final report between its admission of the empirical fact of absolute freefall and a theory of progressive collapse that rules out absolute freefall. This contradiction can be seen as the ultimate self-destruction of the official conspiracy theory about what happened in New York on 9-11, which says that Muslim terrorists brought down three high-rise buildings at freefall speed by collapsing, by, by crashing planes into two of them. I will conclude by addressing members of the 9-11 Truth movement, both old members and any new members that this lecture may have created. I'm an optimist. Rather than letting up on our efforts to get the truth about 9-11 revealed, now is the time to work even harder. Jens mentioned in the introduction that my latest book, The New Pearl Harbor Revisited, was named Pick of the Week in November of last year by Publishers Weekly. Publishers Weekly is, in the English-speaking world, the Bible for book uh, uh, stores and librarians. It tells them of the thousands of books that's, that are published every week, which ones are worth getting. In 2004, it panned my New Pearl Harbor, calling it ridiculous, absurd conspiracy theory. When I put out my second book on the 9-11 Commission report, it said essentially the same thing. But in 2008, it named my book as one of the 51 best books of the year. That is a remarkable cultural shift. So I tell this story not just to brag, but that too, but to point out that something remarkable has happened. Publishers Weekly relies on its prestige. 
It would do nothing to endanger its reputation. In 2004, 2005, it would not have dared say, uh, to, to say such a thing about my books, to say that these books that say that 9-11 was an inside job are good books, among one, some of the best books of the year. But in 2008, obviously they would have had a meeting. They would have debated, do we dare do this? Even if we believe it, can we say it? Will it destroy our reputation? They said it. So it suggests that the fear is starting to dissipate. The fear of endorsing the alternative conspiracy theory. So uh, journalists now may start to follow suit. Maybe some editors will have the courage to uh, publish some things. Maybe some editors will lose their jobs for the sake of the good of the world. We can hope so. This shift in the status of the 9-11 Truth Movement and its theory uh, will be intensified, this cultural shift, as people become more aware of all these organizations that I have named, architects and engineers and, and scientists and intelligence officers and political leaders and religious leaders and on and on and on for 9-11 Truth as people realize that the evidence is overwhelmingly on our side and the fact that these organizations of professionals and scientists have formed is proof for those who don't have time to study for themselves that the evidence is on our side. So I would say now that we should take it as given that the truth about 9-11 has been established beyond any reasonable doubt. The truth being simply that the official story is a lie. The details we can debate about, about what really happened. The only thing that is really important is the official story is false, therefore we need a new investigation, an independent investigation. Um, and this, so what we need to do now is focus our attention on getting this truth publicly recognized. And I would suggest there are uh, at least two major ways to do this. One way is through the political route. So let's do everything we can to build up political leaders for 9-11 truth and intelligence officers for 9-11 truth. Uh, these organizations that will be persuasive to politicians that uh, the truth is on our side and not on the other side. And bring pressure on the Obama, Obama administration to inaugurate uh, a new investigation. Or to have uh, investigations uh, by commissions in uh, European countries, maybe Europe as a whole or in a collection of European countries. Uh, it won't help if it's done in an unfriendly country, the United States can dismiss it. But if it's done in Germany, in France, um, they cannot dismiss uh, such a thing as done by people who are hostile, uh, uh, historically hostile to the United States. A second route would be the legal route. Any country that lost people in 9-11 can institute a suit to say, we don't believe the truth has been established as to why our citizens were killed. Any family that has lost loved ones in 9-11 can institute a suit. And now because we have lawyers for 9-11 truth, there are lawyers you can find who would represent you. Uh, so everybody here knows a lawyer probably. Talk to your lawyer. Tell him about the evidence, him or her. and. Uh, build up this organization. So we've only got, uh, with lawyers and, and political leaders now, around uh, 50 members in each organization. Architects and engineers is headed towards, uh, towards 1,000. We need to get up to several hundred in these. Also religious leaders for 9-11 Truth. Uh, most people know some religious leader who might be open to, to evidence. And this is the main reason, one of the main reasons I was uh, 
interested in coming to Europe is to spread the word about all of these new organizations and encourage people to either sign up or tell their friends, acquaintances about these uh, organizations uh, to build those up. So it gives an answer to a question I'm always asked, well, what can I do as an ordinary citizen? You know, you, Dr. Griffin, you can write books, you can give lectures, but what can I do? Well, you know these people, you can help build up these organizations. So uh, that's the thought I would lead you with. And the reason this is important is because we do need uh, an investigation that will finally reveal publicly reveal the truth about 9-11 so that the policies that were based on the Bush-Cheney conspiracy theory about 9-11 can finally and completely be reversed. Thank you very much for your attention. a little problem in our world is called plutocracy. The rich control everything. They control the media. The rich are getting richer because of 9-11 and the so-called war on terror. They will not allow their reporters to report these things. If reporters report them or try to report them, they will lose their jobs. They know that. So we've got a very serious problem. So I'm not suggesting that getting the truth out is going to be easy. I'm just saying that it's more possible now than it was before. And uh, because there is a possibility, uh, and because getting the truth revealed is so important, so overwhelmingly important for the reasons Annie listed earlier, um, we should try. Um, the, um, you know, the quotation I uh, read from Sinclair Lewis, that, that applies preeminently to <laughs> journalists. Journalists just can't understand what we're saying because they're paid not to understand it. Uh, um, I have some experience of people who no longer are employed and suddenly can see the truth. Uh, so uh, it, it's a serious problem. Um, so you shouldn't be so hard on the journalists themselves. Uh, many of them know. Even I, I got a report the other day from somebody who had talked to members of uh, Fox News, if you know. Uh, Fox News in the United States is the most right-wing um, uh, TV network. And uh, some of the Fox News reporters say, oh, well, we know, but our executives will not let us uh, report these facts. Okay, one more question. Um, who could head an investigation if so many states and institutions are kind of complicit in uh, Actually, the policy of Yes, uh, that's another serious problem. And we don't know which countries uh, were complicit. Uh, we've got a pretty good idea with some of them that they at least knew in advance that the attacks were coming. But with other countries, uh, we don't know. For example, I don't know about Germany whether the German leaders knew in advance or not. Um, uh, the Canadian and, uh, and others. Now, with regard to Japan, um, we have a very interesting situation. 
because the uh, one of the two founders of political leaders for 9-11 Truth is Yukihisa Fujita. He is a senator. He's in the upper house in uh, Japan. And he was um, exposed to 9-11 Truth by a citizen in Japan. She happened to be uh, the citizen who had translated uh, the New Pearl Harbor into Japanese. But she already knew. She didn't learn this from that. She was already there before I was, I think. Um, but this is an example of what an ordinary citizen can do by having to know Fujita. She was able to talk to him and convince him. And then he stood up in the Japanese uh, parliament in a, in a committee meeting, but a big committee meeting that was being televised nationally, and argued that Japan should withdraw from the war on terror, should withdraw its support from the United States war on terror, because 9-11 was a lie. And he presented the evidence with graphs and charts and pictures of the Pentagon and, and so on. Um, Fujita's party, he's not the leader of his party, but he is, he's, he's a high-ranking uh, member of the party. Um, it's almost certain that they will win uh, control of the government whenever the next election is held. So there will be the possibility that the Japanese government as such might speak out uh, about 9-11. Uh, so that's one possibility. And if that could occur in Japan, it could occur in other countries uh, that were not complicit, or at least uh, where the present leaders of the country were not in office at the time and were not complicit. So, uh, so there are possibilities. And then um, I, I know some of these questions were, were raised before I made, uh, written before I made my final point, but. Uh, the, I would repeat again that uh, even more likely might be the legal route. Uh, William Pepper is an American lawyer, quite well known, who also uh, works a lot in Europe. He is the lawyer who proved in a legal case, in a court case, that uh, Martin Luther King was not assassinated by James Earl Ray. This is proved now. The American press has not revealed this proof <laughs> to the American people. That's pretty astounding. So still officially in the press, James Earl Ray is still guilty of assassinating Martin Luther King, even though the evidence is overwhelming that it was our own FBI. Um, Anyway, Bill Pepper has argued that even more likely than the political route uh, might be the legal route. And so he has encouraged uh, people who are in position to initiate a lawsuit uh, to do so. And he has essentially volunteered his services uh, to this. And uh, there are many other lawyers uh, who belong to Lawyers for 9-11 Truth. And uh, hopefully soon there will be many more from uh, Europe. And uh, so this is another route. So we shouldn't think it's hopeless. There are ways that this could be done. And there are other ways that right now I, I don't want to talk about, but that have, given, have raised my own estimation from saying maybe we have a 5% possibility to uh, maybe 15 or 20% uh, possibility. Yeah, okay. So basically... Uh you should look up the latest work on David Ray Griffin. I have about 10 of his books, and they are what got me started on the actual road to you know, finding out the details that were available. Uh, everybody has a, how did you get started on 9-11? Of course, you know, you begin to realize right away that once they fool you and you find out that they were lying, then they can't fool you again. I mean, I'm not trying to paraphrase the, the, the George Bush stupidity comment <laughs> but uh really once you get wise to how easy it is and, and they do it over and over again because it usually works but once you're hip to it you spot it every time and 
of course, for me, it was just a question of getting more details. And of course, the more details you got, <laughs> the more you were saying, yeah, of course, I was right. Well, now, I started covering a lot of the Israel-Palestine slaughter, that, where Israel is I illegally surrounding, invading, and slaughtering the, the Palestinians. Now they've, you know, slaughtered over a thousand. They have absolutely zero justification for this. And uh, my show and others have been running stories about this. Yesterday, which would be Friday the 25th, we had uh, a show called A Growing Concern with Jim Lockhart where we had two representatives of the Palestinian movement here in Oregon uh, talking. And then we opened it up for phone calls and somebody called in and was just really abusive and... It's amazing. This it, uh, Portland is a stronghold for pro-Israeli sentiment, and it's amazing to see uh, how many people turn off their humanity to follow their dogma. I'm going to show you now a clip that I talked about last week with young Israelis who are the hope of the future. Now, keep that in mind. And and listen to what they say. This is only a couple minutes long, but this is it speaks for itself. But at the end, this is the lady who says, I guess I'm kind of a fascist. Oh, my God. Okay, they don't learn anything from history, primarily because history continues to be rewritten by the winner. <laughs> okay, let's play it. in macabre form for tourism. It bombs that and not a helicopter. Fra bakketoppene følger israelerne med i bombardementerne af Gaza og indtager deres medbragte mad i frokostpausen samtidig. We want to see it in, in our own eyes, not from television uh, point of view. They chose Hamas to rule them. It's their fault. They, they got it to where it is now, not us. But don't you think you'll get worse by bombing them? No, I think that's the only solution. I think, I think they should just clear off all the city. <laughs> just take it off the ground. Yes, I'm a little bit fascist. Oh, I'm a little bit fascist. Oh, God. They, they make a musical like that, huh? Let's open up to some Let's questions. Uh, oops. We have mic runners. I think we're going to start. Turn, uh, I mean, we'll I'm going to get the next so video set off. up here. But I have to... Let's see. My name yeah. is Zach Taylor. Okay, this... Uh, oops. I'm ready... Oops. <laughs> I'm ready to play the next one, but let me introduce it before Taylor. we get going on it. Uh, oh, it keeps jumping wrong size. I, I got to get the get this together here. I'm operating yes. a Mac, and I'm a PC guy. My name is Zach Taylor. We know your name is Zach Taylor. Okay, so what I'm what I'm about to play, we have a crisis going on in in our southwest and south southern states, where uh, the Obama administration has purposely opened the border, dozens of places along the border open, f purposely bringing in busloads that they're organizing thousands of miles away, deliberately bringing them in, and anyway, here's a, a border patrol, uh, retired border patrol guy named Zach Taylor. And he's going to tell you about it. Uh, it might pre come pretty close to filling up the end of this show, but let's see how it goes. This is really something that people have not been covering. So this is another local Portland scoop. Retired Here we go. Go ahead. And officer. My main job was understanding and having intelligence capabilities about drug smuggling across the U.S. border and human smuggling across the U.S. border to bring contraband and people into the United States. That's what I did for 26 years. National security is a component of the immigration laws and the reason that immigration officers exist. Because the immigration laws are designed to primarily do just two things. Protect national security and public safety. The component of national security is the economy and American jobs. Because the foundation of American society, which is the family unit, depends on jobs and the economy for their livelihood. On the other side is the public safety, which includes public health. And that is so the people will be secure in their persons and their property from outside source threats. In other words, people coming in to take over America by force or by subterfuge. Right now, 
Department of Homeland Security is in charge of, through Customs and Border Protection, the apprehension and collection of the illegal aliens. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention is in charge of the screening with the U.S. Public Health Service. I've never seen the CDC or U.S. Public Health Service work together with the Border Patrol at the border, ever. The agents are telling us that they're seeing some people that are obviously sick uh, with shivering type illnesses, uh, with possibly uh, uh, dehydrating illnesses like diarrhea and vomiting. But those people are disappearing. We don't know what they have, where they're going, where they're taking them. Surely they, they're being quarantined somewhere, we just don't know where. And even the agents don't know what the uh, diagnosis is of these illnesses. Tie that in with the fact that these people can come through almost anywhere in the world and are funneling into Mexico. And we already know there's epidemic uh, levels of certain diseases in Mexico and Central America. We don't know if these people are showing these diseases, if they're even being screened for them. The real troubling part of this is we know that in West Africa right now, there's an Ebola outbreak that does not meet the parameters of communicable diseases. Normally, Ebola virus starts in the jungle and moves into an indigenous population in the jungle and then from there into a larger population area. What they're experiencing in West Africa in three countries right now is an Ebola outbreak in three separate cities at the same time. This is very unusual. It is almost as if the virus was planted in those three cities to infect that population. In other words, the, the virus is working in the reverse of what it has historically. Before it moved from the jungle into the populated area, now it's starting in the most populated areas in those cities and working through the population. If we had a control event, I'll give you an example. Border Patrol has a drug smuggling operation and they've been surveilling it. And after the car loads up and takes off, we stop the car. And the person driving the car hands us a diplomatic passport saying they're a diplomatic uh, alien inside the United States. We stop right there. We call the Department of State. The Department of State takes it from there. The person is not prosecuted. Yes, we may or may not seize the vehicle and the drugs. The United States public never knows that happened. That's a controlled event. In this situation, where you have hundreds of thousands, literally, of people coming across the border, and you're only catching a small fraction, if you're not telling the public that 80 to 90 percent of what's coming across the border is not being apprehended, and you're putting their focus on this 10 percent that is being apprehended, only showing them the 1 percent that are 6, 8, 10 years old and appeal to the compassion of the American people and not show them the people with these serious communicable diseases, the fact that they are known gang members, they have the gang tats all over them, because they do not have a conviction in the United States, they're turned loose free in the United States. We don't know when CDC takes custody of one of these people from Homeland Security and whisk them off somewhere we don't know where, what disease they have been diagnosed with. We know it's communicable. We assume it's serious. But that is being kept away not only from the agents in Department of Homeland Security, it is part of the controlled event where America doesn't realize how serious the threat is and they're only being shown the compassionate side of the situation. That 1 to 2 percent of those 160,000 that appeal to the compassionate side of the people of the United States. What the people don't realize, that it is putting their own children at risk. Because these children are going to be put in schools with their children. 
this administration and past administrations have not lived up to enforcing the rule of law with regards to national security and immigration laws. The reason we're having the press of the Central American miners is because this particular administration has invited them to come here. The problem, as I see it, and as apparently because Center for Disease Control, Health and Human Services, and Department of Homeland Security are trying to make this a control situation, they're anticipating a large national crisis. When you see that FEMA is preparing for 200 million deaths in the United States, that tells you something. When you see that the government is controlling the supply of ammunition and that basic medical supplies are in short supply in southern Arizona, something's wrong. They are anticipating something drastic. If they had enforced the law, if they didn't enforce the immigration law, and if they had expeditiously removed these people that came here, this group of minors, they would have dealt with this situation. The way they are reacting to it is facilitating and inviting more of the same. So what they're doing is making a bad situation much worse. The real reason these people are probably coming here from an intelligence point of view is to mask or draw attention away from something else that is happening. Since the United States government is encouraging this, it is something that the United States government wants to happen. They have significant CIA, FBI, Department of State, Homeland Security, uh, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, you name it, in Central America right now have been there a long time. They know what's going on. We're not doing anything to stop the obvious threat. Two years ago, I became acquainted with a person that lives in Mexico City. I have complete, total confidence in this person as an informant. Uh, he's beyond reproach. And he told me when I asked him, I was concerned about two things. And that was the trafficking of human organs in Mexico and the extreme violence the uh, beheadings and dismemberments that were going on in Mexico. Now, understand this person is pretty much as a, an unbiased observer that has almost unlimited access to all levels of both government and society in Mexico. Without hesitation, he told me that the most influential uh, criminal organization in Mexico City that, at that time was the Russian Mafia. And through other sources, I knew that they were a very important component in Ecuador and in the tri-border area in South America. So when you start to think about the dynamics of what's going on in Mexico, think transnational criminal. Think of people beyond Mexico. Think beyond Central America. And think of criminals, period. The reason they come to the United States is because this is where the money is. The agent is much more afraid of his own government than he is of the transnational smuggler. Because they're not only messing with the agent's pay right now, they're telling him to run away from an assault. You know, if somebody wants to fight, leave him alone. Don't shoot at anybody. They just told the local border patrol here that they're not going to get any ammunition for their rifles until 2015. What's that about? They're not going to have any practice ammo for their car fours until 2015. Well, that's over a year away. FY 2015 starts in October. So what is it that the Border Patrol agents aren't going to get? Where historically, Department of Homeland Security used to buy ammunition for the Border Patrol by the boxcar load. You're saying the Border Patrol agents in Tucson sector have to ration their ammunition for the next 14, 15 months? They can't use it. They're doing zero accountability. In other words, they can't shoot any of it, and it's being accounted for round for round. The rules are you have to, practice, you have to qualify, demonstrate proficiency at a minimum level with each firearm that you're authorized to use. Handgun, shotgun, rifle. When the agent is one, 
not allowed to maintain his basic proficiency with the firearms that he uses and train with them on a quarterly basis, he is less proficient. If he is less proficient and doesn't have access to ammunition, he's less likely to take that firearm into the field and have it available should he need it. That raises the risk level to the individual agent because the purpose of having the superior fire force is to deter someone from attacking you. The whole idea of asymmetrical warfare is to defeat your enemy from within. It is not to attack him from without. Of course, the threat comes from without, but they have to be inside of the United States to affect a successful warfare strategy. If asymmetrical warfare is going to be successful, the first thing that has to be done is to compromise America's defenses against invasion because they have to have their personnel inside the United States to affect the infrastructure. Our hospitals, our schools, our electric grid, our power supplies, our water supply. Basically, what we call infrastructure. All of those things create in our infrastructure. But they have to affect the degeneration from inside the United States. The markers that we're seeing that indicate this is asymmetrical warfare is because the reaction that the United States is taking is they're taking the opportunity of inviting these illegal aliens to come here they're concentrating them in one place in the United States, the Rio Grande Valley, and they're drawing the resources that are protecting the rest of the United States border to care for the illegal alien children, to uh, help with the overflow of the minors, to transport, to take care of the needs of these people while they're in Homeland Security custody. All this takes the resources that are protecting America at the border off of the border. So now the borders are wide open. This gives the people that are trying to get their infrastructure, their personnel, their drugs, their dirty bombs, their biological weapons, their chemical weapons into the United States without being noticed because this part of the border is open. It is not being patrolled. It is a perfect military strategy it doesn't raise any eyebrows because we're focused on the children. But we need to focus on our children because this is asymmetrical warfare. Everything says it is. And the way the United States government is responding to it is concealing that fact from the American people. In other words, they're assisting in the downfall of America. You need to understand this. Okay, we're just kind of cutting that short because we're ending the show. That was the very end. Uh, I just want to say Alex Ansari will be f taping a show tonight about the Palestinian crisis, and it'll be shown on Wednesday, Channel 22 at 10 p.m. Don't miss it.